that you're not lukewarm, that you're not apostate, that you're not a false prophet, that you don't just run around making up and putting hair on your stories where it's half prophetic and half pathetic. That's not salty. He don't care. God don't care and people don't care about your dreams that you made up. Come on. I'm all for people seeing angels until there's no fear of the Lord. I saw an angel for breakfast. I saw an angel for lunch. I saw an angel for dinner. Well, you didn't fall down like a dead man? You didn't get scared? Nothing? No, I just saw another angel. One through there. One through there. Okay. Everyone I read in scripture responded differently. Then put it in my iPad and tell everybody about my angel experience. Then we got the other Christian group. They never saw the angel. They never felt the Holy Ghost, nothing, but they just see demons all the time. And they think that's their gift. You know, just, I'm a demon seer. <laughs> Show me Jesus. I believe in discerning the devils. I believe in angelic forces revealing themselves. I'm concerned that some people's encounters are for their own ego, which is why they add hair to the story. And that's not salty. We don't need you lying about your testimony. If you weren't a drunker, don't tell everybody you were a drunker. You used to kind of drink. If you took a needle one time, don't tell everybody you once were an addict. My God, don't put hair on your testimony. It's not salty. Just tell people what you came out of, whatever it was. Don't exaggerate it. Come on, we got too many preachers. They're liars. They exaggerate. If you were really that bound, tell us. We want to know about it. But don't try to compare and contrast because you're not salty anymore. Because God knows in the spirit realm exactly what happened. And if we add here to the story, we lose our flavor. It's called lying. So the next question I got to ask myself, when I worship, do I make people thirsty? When I preach, do I make people thirsty? See, if I preach to you tonight and you feel like, man, that God in my spirit, man, I want more of that. Then I'm like, okay, God, thank you for making me salty. But if I come in here tonight and you're like, man, I can't wait till he shuts up, man, just sits down. That might be out of offense, but it could be that I'm not salty. We just got to be honest. I've been in meetings and there was no salt in the pulpit. The saddest part is we want to make them feel good and we'll say, amen. Ooh, I can feel God. And I'm like, I don't even know if God's in the zip code. I know he's in my heart. But I don't feel God. Quit trying to make everybody feel good and stop saying God's here. I know he's everywhere at the same time, but we know that tangible manifestation of God when he comes in a concentrated form. If we learn how to lie over time consistently, we lose our flavor, and it's called charismatic witchcraft, where we do a lot of talking, but there's no demonstration of power. It's kind of like meetings where people want people to fall down so bad that they're doing the Pentecostal shutdown. I don't need a courtesy fall. The power of God don't knock you down, don't fake it. You're going to make it not look salty. It's going to be a false appearance of salt. Then your, your buddy does a courtesy fall. Then we got counterfeit salt. I'm just saying what you've been thinking a long time. That's part of my gift. You're like, thank God somebody said it. Don't act like you didn't have the same thought. So if we're not making people thirsty, Jesus said we might as well be trampled on. I want the team to go ahead and come. Listen to this. Last one here. Salt enhances. I want you to write this down for the note takers. It enhances what it is served on. Now I want you to understand this. Mashed potatoes are pretty good with butter. But you know when they need salt. Amen? And the french fries are pretty good until they forgot the salt. And then you're like, why do these taste so bad? They were pretty good. And then, and then you go in that Mexican restaurant and it's like, man, the chips have a decent flavor. but And then the salsa needs it. And then the steak needs it. And you're like, 
And it's in the pizza, and it's in every, and it's in Navajo tacos. Come on. I don't care what it is. If that is not there, then the quality is not there. The flavor of that thing, it brings out the flavor of the meat. It brings out the flavor of the Navajo bread. It doesn't matter what it is. If you leave salt out of the equation, the quality is not there. It is not enhanced. And this is what God says. You did not come to be served, but to serve. Jesus did not come to be served. He said, I came to serve and lay down my life as a ransom. So you're actually the flavor to Christianity. So what's the world tasting? Are they tasting bitterness? Are they tasting hurt with the church? Are they tasting offense? What are they tasting? Are they tasting anger and rage within the family? I know we love Jesus, but I want you to understand that what you do and the flavor that comes off of your life is an expression of the taste of your Christianity. And I don't want my life to taste in such a way that it causes someone's face to twist up. Because they look at me and say, you say you love Jesus, but we see you over there. You're not going to see me cruising the liquor out. You're not going to see me playing around with some prescribed marijuana. They're going to see me with uh, one beer because I'm not getting drunk. And the Bible says, you know what, I shouldn't get drunk. It doesn't say I shouldn't drink. No, John the Baptist wouldn't touch strong drink or wine at all. And he would prepare the way of the Lord. There is a generation of burning ones that will prepare the way of the Lord. That says, I'm not putting any unclean thing before my mouth. That anything that's a cheap copy of the Holy Ghost, I don't want it here. It could impact my flavor. My wife knows this. I don't want beer battered onion rings. <laughs> You're like, oh my gosh. I don't. I don't want beer battered fish. I used to like that chicken marsala at Olive Green at Olive Garden. Then I realized, hang on here, now they're slapping wine all over this thing and smothering it. But the alcohol kicks out. No, but see, I can still taste it. See, that's my problem. I said my problem. I didn't say your problem. Don't get mad at me. I don't care how much marsala, beer battered, whatever you eat. But I'm telling you, if you're cooking like that, you know how much destruction you got to do to your testimony to go get the alcohol? Well, I'm just buying for cooking. Are you going to get up on the PA and say, hey, everybody, I'm a Christian. I'm just buying this vodka and this rum because I'm going to make a cake. No, you're losing your flavor because you don't have a PA system. You buy the vodka, you buy the rum, and everybody thinks you're a drunk thug. Called a Christian. Are you realizing how much red tape you have to cross to get your cooking recipe? Amen. So we're just talking about flavor. What's our flavor look like? Y'all okay? <laughs> so like, oh my God, I gotta go home clean again. <laughs> I tell them I don't want any wine bottles given to me from 1972. I don't want those spirits in my house. You can have them in yours if you want, but when you come to my house, you feel the presence of God. Amen? Somebody's like, man, I, I gotta do a house cleaning if I answer this altar call. I'm just asking how you're thinking. <laughs> <laughs> I love you, Jesus. These are the things I want you to understand. Some some would call this legalistic. I've been I've been called legalistic, all kinds of things that don't faze me. What man calls legalistic, I still believe is holy. I still believe that. I was sharing this not long ago. You know, we make fun of the the Pentecostal buns and you know the no makeup wearing and all that. And I'm not insinuating you need to have a Pentecostal bun and not wear makeup. But at a heart level. 
They came to church ready for a move of the Holy Ghost. Amen. You don't know why they put their Pentecostal bun up? Because if the power of God knocked them to the floor, they didn't want their hair all over the place. <laughs> you want to know why they didn't wear makeup originally? Originally, I want you to understand this. Because they planned on weeping under the fire of God. Amen. And they didn't want to have a distraction of my, my mascara, my eyelashes over here. <laughs> but they just didn't want all that. And so they simplified it. Now, if you want that battle, you can have it. We're not anti-makeup around here. Amen? We're really not. We're not forceful Pentecostal bun wearers either. But I'm just saying there's something about the purity of heart that attracts the Holy Spirit. Do you hear what I'm saying? When, when I say to God, I'm not going to put strong drink to my mouth. That's why when I walk under a tent, I can have an expectation that the fire of God is going to fall in this place. No questions asked. It won't be trip cameras. It won't be special effects. My God, it won't be anything other than the Holy Ghost moving. So God, we want you tonight. Come on, I want you to stand to your feet. If we can play soft for just a moment. We just want you tonight, Jesus. We just want the Holy Ghost. Come on, pray with me. Don't be condemned tonight. Don't be condemned tonight. Just let, let, let the fire of God begin to move over you and move through you. Now listen to me. The resource table will open. My wife in just a moment will open the table after there's probably going to be bodies laying all over the place. But at some point you can shop. But I probably won't make that announcement again. Here's what we want to do really quick. Every head bowed, every eye closed for just a moment. If you're underneath this tent, if we play just a little lighter, just a little lighter, because I want the lost man to hear me loud and clear. There is nothing in this world worth going to hell for. Not one thing. There isn't one high, one moment of drunkenness, one root of bitterness, one anger or rage, forceful, destructive weaponry of the enemy that is worth burning in hell for. And Jesus must be Lord of all or he's not Lord at all. I'm not preaching Christian perfection. Hear me. A righteous man falls down seven times, but he gets back up again. How many has had to get up again before? And God has been redemptive, and he has been merciful, and he has been gracious. But we cannot live like hell and think we're going to heaven. It is not possible to live like hell and go to heaven. And so with every head bowed and every eye closed, if you were to die, I'm serious. This isn't just some old school evangelistic question. If your body expired, one or two things are going to happen. If you know Jesus, the angels are going to escort you into heaven. They'll say, behold, the Lamb of God, well done, my good and faithful servant. Your name will be written in the Lamb's book of life. Jesus has been working on your mansion. It's going to be a glorious day. And the most awesome part is that preacher don't have to lie at your funeral. If you do not know Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, if your body expires, if you have a heart attack, if cancerous cells eat up your body, if you're in a head-on collision, whatever it is that causes your body to expire, they could be gassing up that hearse now. The mortuary could be preparing for your body. Your name could be going into the obituary soon. And if you're not sold out to Jesus, Demon spirits will come to escort your spirit and soul, not to heaven, but to hell. And you will forever be separated from God. You won't be able to repent there. You won't be able to ask Jesus in your heart there. You will be forever separated from God. And Jesus paid a high price so that you would not have to experience hell. He's so madly in love with you. For greater love has no man than this. Then he laid out his life for his friends. The love of God cast out all fear. It's the most powerful manifestation in the earth. The love of Jesus Christ. And here's the question that you've got to respond. If you are not 100% certain that you're ready to meet Jesus if you die. 100%. If you're 99, you're not ready. If you're 95, you're not ready. If you're 88, you're not ready. There is no partial salvation. You're saved or you're not. And if you don't know if you're saved, you're not. There's no way God moves in and you don't know. So if you don't know, you're going to hell. If you don't know if you're ready, I know 
you're not. Because the Bible says the Holy Spirit bears witness with your spirit that you are a child of God. And if there is not an inner witness, hell awaits you. But God wants to move into your heart tonight. So first order of business always is so that heaven can have a party and rejoice over one soul coming to Jesus. If you're not ready, I want you to slip your hand. If you say, I'm not ready to meet Jesus, I'm not certain. Slip your hand up so we can identify you. I'm not certain. I see that hand. I see that hand. I'm not certain. I'm not certain. I see that hand. I'm not certain. I want those that are not certain to make your way to this altar right now. Come on, don't be ashamed. He hung naked on the hillside for you. If you don't know, you're not. Come on, if you're not certain, there is more of you. Don't be ashamed. Just come on down. The love of God is here. We're not going to embarrass you. We're not going to do anything crazy. We're just going to introduce you to Jesus. Anybody else tonight? some religion that allows us to attend not be interrupted, not be uncomfortable, not be concerned that someone might call my sin out point me out in the middle of a meeting and read my mail. I don't want that Holy Ghost. So pastors started kicking it out when they found that they didn't want the Holy Ghost to tell on them in their own meetings. He said they're going to want Christianity but Christ won't be the foundation of it. They'll be homosexual Christians. They'll be drunk Christians. Not everyone you know says they're a Christian. Amen. Do you believe in God? Yeah, I believe in God. So they're going to want Christianity, but they won't want the Christ in Christian. They won't want that part that says, if any man desires me, may he deny himself, take up his cross, and follow me. They won't want the death of themselves. The Apostle Paul said, I'm crucified. Just, I die daily. One scripture says, I'm crucified with Christ. I no longer live. The, that which lives down in me is Christ. The hope, the life, the glory of God. On the end. So for those he foreknew, he did also predestine that you be conformed into the image of Jesus. They'll want Christianity without Jesus. He says this, they're going to want forgiveness, but without repentance. Forgive me, Lord. Okay, I'm a drunkard. Forgive me, Lord. Okay, forgive me, Lord. I gossip. Forgive me, Lord. I acted a fool. Forgive me, Lord. I slept around. Forgive me, Lord. No, repentance means to change your mind. Change your direction. Stop thinking that way and stop doing it. Not going back to God saying, he knows my heart. Forgive me, Lord. Forgive me, Lord. Forgive me, Lord. Forgive me, Lord. That's not repentance. Let me tell you something. Forgiveness is what God does. Repentance is what you do. And if you're not willing to be the other part of the relationship, you will burn in hell. God is not in the business of just forgiving without any repentance. Amen. Repent for the kingdom of God is at hand. It's the first message of John the Baptist that lost his head calling someone to repentance. There's a bunch of sin happening. There's sexual immorality. When he called it out in the call of repent for the kingdom of God is at hand, his head was on a platter. Amen. 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 Sometimes when I preach, I feel like my head's on a platter. They'll want salvation. Save me, Lord. I want to go to heaven, but there won't be a real regeneration. Regeneration means to be born again. Everybody says he saved me. He washed me in the blood, but they don't live born again. Some people say, well, I was born homosexual. Okay, I get it. Now get born again. Amen? Amen? If you're born that way, then I got something for you. You get to be born again. Well, my daddy was a drunkard. I get it. Okay, then be born again. Don't give me all them bloodline generational cursed devils that you act like God can't set you free from. The God I know will set you free from sin and death at all levels. That's the God we know. That's the God we serve. Enough with the excuses. If it's not right for you to live for God, then don't. You will live for the devil, then live with him forever. Choose this day who you will serve. There is no gray areas in the kingdom. And there's no special convictions for me and special convictions for you. There's one convictor. His name is the Holy Ghost. And he convicts according to the Word of God. He said they're going to want politics without God. You do realize that Benjamin Franklin failed. Look at this. When the Constitution of the United States happened, he was failing at, at really in the constitutional meeting. He couldn't get anything done. And then he had a vision of contacting the pastors. 
He called the clergy. They started a prayer meeting. And then America got a constitution. Amen. Once God was the politics. When God himself established a nation. Yeah. William Booth's like they're going to want politics in the last days. But they won't want God to govern it anymore. It's called a theocracy. Not a democracy. God governs America. This nation was born. And every other nation and tribe. This is the earth. The earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof. How many still believe that? That he still holds the deed to this planet. Nobody can vote him out of office. He's God. And beside him there is no other. I didn't plan on preaching these, but I got stirred up about them, so I had to. <laughs> these ain't even one of the points, and so I hope you got a Snickers in your purse. <laughs> Amen? <laughs> We're on Navajo times. I'm going to use it against you now. <laughs> well, what time's that? I don't know. I haven't known the time since I got here. We had to call the front desk and say, what time is it? They're going to want a heaven without a hell. They're going to want streets of gold, but no opposite. They want to talk about mansions. Do you realize 0.005%? Look at this. Of America actually believes that hell has fire anymore. A lot of them believe that there's a hell, but they don't believe it's a place of torment. They don't believe it's a place of fire. They don't believe that Psalm says it has jail cells. They don't believe it's a place of torment where one man, the rich man, just wanted a little bit of drop of water. That lets us know in hell you're thirsty, but you don't have water. You want friendship, but you can't have none. You want everything that's life-giving, but there is no life there. You want light, but there is none. Every life-giving thing you can imagine is still a desire in your heart, but yet there's no delivery of those things because in hell there is no life. There's only death. It's a place of utter torment because the desire is there with no fulfillment. Well, how would this loving God do this? This loving God didn't do anything but give you a ticket to heaven if you want it. For God so loved the world, he gave his only begotten son. That whosoever believes in him shall not perish, but have everlasting life. That's the God of the Bible. He's not sending people to hell. You're sending yourself there when you don't want Jesus Christ as Savior, Master, Lord, Redeemer. My God, you don't want him to be everything. You don't want the Lordship. Jesus is Lord of all, or he's not Lord at all. Amen? Amen? Period.com.org.info.edu. How many dots we got now? Dot native? <laughs> Here's God's resume. Let me get to you really quick. He's always been in the business of preserving things. He don't change. How many believe he's a God that doesn't change? He's not changing with the presidency. He's not changing with what's happening even on tribal lands. They can come up with whatever they want. God's not changing. How I many know he will bless you in the city and bless you in the field and he don't need any government permission to do so? Amen? Amen. I've never seen the righteous forsaken nor his seed begging bread. How many righteous people in the house have seen the hand of God in your life? Come on. You've seen him move when people say he shouldn't be moving. Because he's the God that defies the natural laws of this earth with the supernatural laws of heaven. God. So he preserves, he protects, he safeguards his people. Listen to these verses. This is God's resume. Psalm 16.1. And I want you to apply this to yourself. And we're going to talk about salt. Preserve me, O God, for you, in you, I put my trust. Psalm 121.7 and 8. Look at this. The Lord shall preserve you from all evil. Preservation. What's going to get bad in the last days? I've got a God that's going to preserve me. Amen. Well, the Antichrist agenda. Let me tell you something. The Antichrist agenda don't stand a chance as long as the church is here. Amen. We pose the greatest threat to their system. Even Hillary Clinton said we'd have much more done except that one thing. We got one problem, she said, the church. I'm glad she recognized that the most powerful force on the earth is the ecclesia, God's legislative force. That we can cry out of the heavens and we can shift the atmosphere. We can overthrow the government in the spirit. We're not looking to overthrow them in the natural. We're looking for God to take the head of the demonic force that they're operating in. Someone said, are you preacher, mid-trib, post-trib? Are you just tripping? I'm like, I'm pre-trib because I got authority over the devil. Amen. Now, I'm not trying to get into eschatology tonight because, I mean, we teach eschatology conferences and my whole sermon can go four hours at this point from right here forward. 
But I do want you to understand this. One of the reasons I believe in the rapture, the catching away of God's people, though many don't believe it, they've aborted that. I've got friends that we're not on the same page. We still do ministry. We believe Jesus died and rose again. We believe in a baptism of the Holy Ghost, and we're seeing souls saved. So we don't have to necessarily agree on this, but I will tell you, Luke 10, 18 says, I've given you authority to tread on the head of every serpent, every scorpion over all the powers of the enemy. And I'm telling you right now, the Antichrist agenda is the powers of the enemy. And so if the Antichrist man was to walk under this tent right now, as ugly as he would be, I'm telling you, we could just get the oil out, sling it in his eyes and command him in the name of Jesus to be set free if we got authority over devils. So how in the world is the Antichrist man going to reveal himself and come beat up the church when God said we've got the authority and the power to take the head of serpent? Real question. I mean, that's a pretty sad looking church if one Antichrist man is going to come beat us all up. Come on, man. <laughs> that's some sick doctrine right there. Amen. So he's going to preserve us. He's going to preserve the first nation from evil. He's going to preserve your soul. The same verse here says the Lord will preserve your going out and he'll preserve your coming in from time forth and even more. Psalm 32, 7 says, you are my hiding place. You preserve me from trouble. You shall surround me with songs of deliverance. Do you realize that Zacharias says that God sings and dances over you? What is the posture of God right now? He's singing and dancing over his people. When the enemy plots against the righteous, the Bible says God laughs at him. I don't know why we cry when we're under attack, when God's laughing. We need to get the right posture. If God's laughing, I'm laughing. Amen? Amen. Preservation. 2 Timothy 4, 18 says, The Lord will deliver me from the evil, from every evil, and watch this, and preserve me for his heavenly kingdom. To him be the glory. Proverbs 2, 8 says, He guards the path of the justice, and he preserves the way of his saints. Psalm 97, 10. It's just some resume I want you to hear. You who love the Lord, how many love the Lord, and hate evil, he preserves the soul of his saints. He delivers them out of the hand of the wicked. Now, watch this. I want you to understand this. The Lord said to me, he said, son, I want you to go ahead and just let the first nation host people of the land know that I have preserved them Hallelujah. more than they realize. Now, I, want, I, want just, I want you to hear this. He said, I preserved them when they broke the treaties. Come on. That didn't wipe you out. I preserved them when the government lied to them. That couldn't wipe you out. When they took blankets and tried to put sickness on you, I still preserved tribes. And that couldn't wipe them out. For I've been a God of preservation. When they stole the land, that didn't wipe you out. For the Lord thy God has preserved you. When they developed policies to keep the First Nations down and to cultivate really an atmosphere of consistent poverty, I have still shown my provision for I, the Lord thy God, have preserved my First Nation host people of the land. For I have turned my face towards them as Apostle Ron has prophesied. I have not forgotten them. I will not forget them. And I have raised them up to be a salty people in the last day. I want to show you this. I want you to understand this is something Jesus said. Not a great historian, not a great preacher, not a blonde-haired, blue-eyed hippie. The King of kings and Lord of lords. Amen? This is what he said. You are the salt of the earth. You're it. If anyone's going to experience a taste of who God is, they're going to have to taste me through my blood-bought, sanctified, Holy Ghost-filled, spirit-adopted, tongue-talking, devil-stomping believers in Jesus Christ. If they're going to taste who I am, they're going to have to taste me through you. Don't lose your flavor. If they're going to know the power of a witness, they're going to know it through you. If they're going to know a baptism of fire, they're going to know it through you. If they're going to see His healing power, they're going to know it through you. You cannot afford to lose your flavor. But everybody don't believe it the way we believe it. I don't care what they believe. You reserve the right to believe according to the word of God. Don't tell me what you've been taught. 
Don't tell me what your church is doing and how dead they are. If your church is dead, that don't mean you have to be dead. Go find an alive church and an alive preacher until you've got your salt back. Because if you lose your flavor, you're in danger in the last days. Now, when I say salt, most of you are thinking, okay, table salt, Morton salt. My God, you've got salt in a little round cylinder. you got salt shakers. Amen? You're checking your salt. Make sure it's not too crazy. Here's what I want you to realize. In the natural, if salt, this is why God compared his church to salt. I'm going to give you a prophetic parallel so that you never forget how serious Jesus is about salt. That this is not just a cute thing like, I don't even know what he meant by salt. I don't even know what he meant. No, 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 no. This is deep stuff. When I say the First Nations going to get real salty real quick, you are going to be the most salty dog just going to move this move of God right in. Because you're going to be like, hang on here. What do you mean you can't forgive them? We've already had to forgive them for a whole bunch of stuff. Why are y'all walking around offended all the time? Amen? So if you're First Nation and you're getting offended every five minutes, you're not salty. I just hate to break it to you. You have not arrived yet. Because there won't be anybody that leads this move of God unless you've got an unoffendable heart. I'm not saying it's impossible for you to be offended, but be offended by, for days and weeks and months and years is certainly not a prerequisite for this move of God. Jesus said if you can't forgive them, he can't forgive you. One of the reasons people stop up the bloodline in the spirit realm, they apply the blood and there's no power is because they've got an offense in their heart and they will not work out forgiveness. One of the reasons they repent of their own sins and they don't feel free is because they're holding someone else in spiritual hostage. They got them in a spiritual jail through offense and they're asking God to forgive them, but they won't forgive them. It's the quickest way to stay in bondage. Forgive quickly. If all the salt on this planet, hear me, this is a proven scientific fact. If you take all the salt and all you did was you were able to extract all salt from the face of the earth. Science did a study. They said this is exactly what would happen. Everything breathing would die within minutes. Just the extraction of salt. We're not talking about water. We're not talking about all the other things in the earth. We're just saying if the salt was removed from the ocean, from our bodies, from everything, as soon as salt is gone, death would occur. So when God says, you are my salt, he's talking next level. This is what else they found. Science says the amount of salt in the ocean is so unlimited there's so much of it, they can't figure out how much is in it. They said it's got an inconceivable amount of salt in the ocean. What if we had an inconceivable amount of people witnessing? See, if God's comparing us to salt and they can't figure out how much salt there is, why is it that most churches are only reporting about three people to ten people getting saved in a year? Because we don't have an inconceivable amount of laborers. See, he warned us the laborers would be few in the last days. The harvest is white, but the laborers aren't there. Here's what else they said. They said that 2,000 years ago when Jesus shed his blood on Calvary's cross, that if you took the salt and you put it right next to gold, it would be synonymous in value. Can you imagine that salt would have the value of gold during the time of Christ? And I want you to understand this. Without it, listen to this. We spent nine months. You came into this earth. You were in your mama's belly, every one of us, in a sack of salt. Not a sack of sugar. So let's get our preaching right. Amen? We got a bunch of spiritual diabetics across this nation. They're real sick. They've been feeding that gospel candy to them every day, and it's like, man, mouth's rotten out, soul's dead. Amen? Let's cut the sugar out in our pulpits. Can we do that? We've got an excessive amount of sugar in these pulpits. But you came floating in this 
sac with salt water. It's called amniotic fluid. If there's a disturbance in the amniotic fluid, the baby dies. The stillborn, the miscarriages, all these things that start happening, they happen because there's an issue within the salt. Listen to this one. That sodium or salt or potassium chloride, listen to this, I want you to hear this, they are electrolytes that dissolve in water but actually carry an electrical charge in water which brings power. So in other words, your heart function, do you realize your heart when it pumps, it actually has enough electrical power in it to drive a truck 25 miles in a day. That's how much power is in the heart. But as soon as the salt content is off, the level of that electrical power suddenly begins to shift and a man can die from low salt. And I say to them, the Navajo Nation and across this nation and the globe, many are dying because there's a lack of salt. The sodium, spiritual sodium of the church is not in adequate balance. We sit in seats, we want to hear a message only so that we can amen and do nothing. The average Sunday morning service, well, what did the preacher preach on today? Well, I can't remember. It was kind of like, why go? And then we're addicted to note-taking. I'm all for note-takers. We got them in our church, too. But my God, are we just going to complete that journal, put it under the bed, and complete the next, put it under the bed, and complete, and, put, and then we got stacks of salt underneath the bed instead of it being in our hearts that we might go into all the world and preach the gospel to every single creature? We're talking about the First Nation saltiness. That God is saying, I'm raising up a salty people, but they must know who they are. In the Middle Ages, they said this about salt. It was nicknamed white gold. The human brain and spine is in a sack. Look at this. The human brain and the spine is in a sack of salt water called, which is the cerebrospinal fluid. Disrupted, you're dead. Every cell in your body contains salt. Listen to this, this is crazy. When you cry, it's salty. When you go to work and sweat, it's salty too. You mean if they break my heart, salt? You mean if I overwork, salt? Yeah, it comes out of your pores and your eyeballs. I want to know if it comes out of your spirit, man. If it comes out of your preaching. If it comes out of your witness. If it comes out of your prayer life. It's salt oozing out of your spirit, man. Like it's oozing out of your body. Amen. Just a question. When he says you're salt of the earth, everything about your body is salty. Watch this. I'm not going to go through all this too much. You're like, come on, come on now, don't worry about it, you're good. So here's your flavor, watch this, it's salty, we're going to keep it there. This is what the, this is what one translation says about this, if it loses its flavor, I want you to get this, or if it loses its savor, is one scripture, which means the salt's capacity, if you're salt, how do I know if I'm losing my savor, how do I know if I'm losing my flavor, this is what it actually means in the original language, it means your capacity or ability to act or affect something is not there. When you talk, no one listens. When you pray, they don't feel nothing. People are in a room worshiping and there's no God bumps. There's no nothing happening and everybody's just going through the motion. What is the problem here? No salt. If it loses its savor, it's called. It's, if it loses its savor, it's actually called a, a dead, stale, old, dried-up religion. And Jesus didn't die so we could have religion. He died so we could have salty relationship. And so, what is it if I don't feel the power? A lack of savor. And when we don't walk in and on a personal level, we go chase the power. We got to go find someone that can go lay hands and bring us all the power. But here's the real question. Are you a carrier of the power? All by yourself at 3 a.m. when a preacher ain't there and a demon shows up in your bedroom. Do you have enough savor and flavor to shift the atmosphere of your own home? Amen? Amen. Well, what are we going to have an altar call about tonight to get so salty? We're going to get seasoned with fire and seasoned with salt. 
How many's up for seasoning salt tonight? Everybody okay with that? We're going to have seasoning salt and fire. Amen? <coughs> Preservation. I want you to hear this. There's three things, at least three things. There's probably four things or five things or ten things, but time... I don't want to spiritually fatigue you because I know if we go too long here, you'll just get up and leave when it's altar time and then look at me funny like I took too long. And, and then before you know it, we're fighting in the spirit, but we won't ever talk about it. I don't want to fight with you. And I don't want to move a God. The First Nation fight is not a good fight. The effects of salt, listen to this. It does three things. Remember this. And this, this is catalytic and parallel and prophetic to your walk. Salt in the natural preserves. It makes you thirsty. And it enhances flavor. So we're going to look at these real quick. And then I'm going to have the worship team come. And we're going to have a Holy Ghost hoedown. Everybody okay with that? Yeah. And so I want you to know what you're coming for when you come to the altar. Salt was used to preserve things. Let me tell you something. In the times of Jesus and before, they didn't have a Whirlpool or Kenmore freezer. They didn't have this ice chest as you know it. They didn't have a bunch of Yetis on their canvas. Okay? They had salt. That's why salt was of such value because if you killed an animal, salt it up, it'll be good. Just get the salt on it. But if you had no salt, you couldn't preserve the meat. You couldn't preserve the food at all. I mean, it would start spoiling, so they just packed the salt. Who's got salt? Well, I got gold. Well, gold's okay, only so I can go buy salt. Because, listen to me, I can only buy so much meat, and I can't keep it so long if I have the gold. But if I got salt, my, me and my family can eat. Come on. Things last when you can preserve them. And so I want you to understand this. The salt that you carry is designed to preserve anything you touch. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believes in him shall not perish, shall not spoil, shall not die, shall not rot in hell. Where is the preservation? The gospel of Jesus Christ through the church. For the gospel is the power of God and the salvation for them that believe. I'm not looking for another power. The gospel is the power of God. One of the reasons there's not any power in the church is there's not any gospel preached. You preach the gospel, the power will fall. You make the service about Jesus instead of about us, he'll move. Amen? I'm like, what are you going to do tonight, God? Talk about me and I'll move. Talk about you, I won't. All right, we got a deal. <laughs> Aren't you sick of the football stories at churches? I can care less who won. I don't want Jersey Day, Friend Day, or any other stupid day. I want the power of God to come. It's the Lord's Day. <laughs> Somebody like, oh my gosh, our church does it every year. <laughs> I would have practiced Robe of Righteousness Day and just look like fools. Won't we all just wear white? <laughs> I could have offended my friends tonight for all I know. I don't know what happens. But listen to this. It preserves. And so I want you to imagine this. I, I need you to think about this. Everyone in this room, this is what we do. And I need you to see it in context. If you went and got a gallon of milk at $9, and eggs at $45. And you fill up your car and you get, you know, you spent three or four hundred dollars and you got two bags because the inflation man is in office. But when you get done with all of that, I want you to understand this for just a moment. There's no way that you are going to get in your car. Hear me. Drive home. Leave it in your car. The hot window rock day comes. Yeah. Your milk's still in the car. Your eggs are still in, and then you forgot, right? No more. At $35 for 12 eggs? Now you're going to actually have some care and concern because you don't want it to perish. And in modern day, we get it to a refrigerator. That's what we do. In their day, they got it to the salt. 
And so if we care that much to make sure that our food don't spoil, the question is, will we have that much love, care, and concern for the lost man to make sure that they won't spoil? Because the only hope is the salty people of God to rise up and say, I must preserve you. Repent for the kingdom of God is at hand. Come to Jesus. And you have a little come to Jesus meeting right there. You don't wait for church on Sunday morning. You don't just pass out a track and forget about them. You tell them of the testimony of what Jesus did that you were once blind but now you see you were once dead but now you're alive you were once deaf but now you can hear the voice of God and you become a salty Christian that makes sure they don't perish it's called preservation that you have the power to preserve man's soul through your testimony and God says I want the first nations host people of the land to be the saltiest forerunners. Amen. Will there be a move of God in the First Nations without an evangelistic fire? No. There's never been a move of God in history without evangelism. The Azusa Street Revival, do you realize God named it after the First Nations? Her name was Koma Lee. Koma Lee prayed for her chief. He was healed. He got so excited, he turned to Komali and said, your name is no longer Komali, it's going to be Azusa. Meaning blessed miracles. When Pentecost decided to come to America, God decided he would honor the First Nation host people of the land and he would name the move of God after the First Nation people. Amen. Why did he name it Paco? Paul or Billy Bob because it's the law first mentioned God recognized the first that's on this land and he will be catalytic to make you salt when Apostle Ron prophesied years ago it wasn't just a cute word that's on Facebook and on the website that says God has turned his people towards the first nation host people of the land. No, it's God saying I'm looking at the founders. I'm looking at the foundation of a nation and when I start getting salty and fiery and impactful, I'm going to look to them first. But I expect them to be a catalytic force. I expect, I expect them to love people, forgive people, do it according to my word not get a chip on their soldier, not shoulder, not get an ego not get prideful and arrogant as if they're the only people that's going to have a move of God. I'm going to raise up every tongue, tribe, and nation, but I'm making them salty first. I'm causing people to want to be in your midst, but are you salty? They're not going to be attracted to native. They're going to be attracted to native salt. Amen. Man, if I had salt, I'd throw it all over you right now. I don't care if it hits your eyes. We just have a big old salt party. You're like, I'll throw it back at you too. Secondly, salt, I want you to understand this. It stimulates thirst. If you go to a movie theater, man, they pack that salt on that popcorn. And at first, you're like, I don't need a drink. It's like $150 for a drink. I'll just take the popcorn. They're like, okay, they're just smiling. You go in there, you're watching the movie. You're like, three pieces of popcorn into it. And you're like, I'm gonna, I don't care if that drink is $250. Could you go get me a big gulp? Because salt immediately produces a thirst. See, we want them to be thirsty for Jesus. That's what he said to the woman at the well. Listen, I got some water for you. I got living water. I've got a water. Listen to me. You will never thirst again out of your belly. Shall flow rivers of living water. See, nobody will want that water unless they first taste the salt of your life and get thirsty. They want to know your testimony salty. They want to know you're the real deal. They want to know that you're not lukewarm playing games with God. They want to know that you're not like a half-hearted Christian. They want to know you're salty and sold out. Worthy is the Lamb. Worthy is the Lamb. If you feel the heat going through your body right now, the fire of the Holy Ghost, when we just slip right out of your seat, God, we loose the fire right now. The fire of the Holy Ghost under this tent. 
And God, I thank you that you're already working. God, that we are apostolic atmosphere shifters with the glory of God. God, that you desire to change entire regions. God, that you want to mark people with your glory tonight. If I can get a couple of men from the team to help me real quick because the fire of God's already falling. I want you to just come stand with me and help me. A couple of men of God, leaders. I'm looking for leaders. Leaders. The fire. The fire. The fire. The fire. The fire. The fire of God. The fire of God. An all-consuming fire. In the name of Jesus. If you're starting to feel it, just slip right out of your seat. The hungry ones tonight. God said, I want you to call out the hungry ones because it's going to set the tone for the next few meetings. The hungry ones. That cares not who's here tonight. Fire! 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 There's a weightiness of God's glory on you. You'll never be the same. You'll never be the same. Mark him and mantle him. Power. Power. Fire. 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 You may say, I've never seen it this way before. Time is running out. We either have the power of God or we don't. Oklahoma, God has a torch of awakening. Start a revival in His region, Lord. A revival, God. I say to you, a revival is coming. Prepare everything for the move of God. Prepare your leaders. Prepare the finances for the move. For a great, a greater glory.
balance of the spirit of the word. But there's someone here tonight. You've been battling stomach ulcers. And then the other person I saw in the spirit, you've had major issues in your digestive system. There may be more than one to respond to this. I want you to come meet me by the fire right here. You say, that's me. Ulcers or digestive system issues. Come stand right here with me. I want to pray over you. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Worthy are you, Jesus. Worthy are you. Don't, don't be ashamed. Don't let your pride defeat you. Pastor Jerry Tom, you come help me real quick. We're going to believe for miracles, signs, and wonders. I didn't know there was this many, but I knew that there was going to be many. Hallelujah. Looking for ulcers and digestive systems. There's not enough preachers that demonstrate with power. They got human wisdom, they got storytelling, and they got dead sermons. You will not survive in the last days without the power of God. There's no other way to do this but a demonstration of power. That your faith may no longer be in men, but in the power of God. If you just responded to this and you're right here, ulcers, stomach issues, you can still come to this altar right here if you need to come down. Lift your hands to heaven and you're going to believe for a miracle. And we're going to believe God to go to work tonight. Some are still coming. But lift your hands. Don't wait on me. I want you to cry out. Just say, God, heal me. Me and Pastor Jerry Tom's coming around. We're going to pray for you. But I want you to start asking God for your miracle. You ask God for your miracle. He already called the word out. He would not dangle a carrot in front of you and lie to you. It's not the God we serve. He doesn't speak word of knowledge so that we can look like idiots. He called it out because his heart is to heal you and set you free. Hallelujah. Touch your Lord. Touch your Jesus. Touch. Touch right now, Lord. Touch, 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 touch. The blood of Jesus. The blood of Jesus. Receive that. Receive that. Receive that. Receive that. He sent his word and healed. He sent his word and healed. He sent his word and healed. Receive. Receive. The Spirit of God's on you. And I see purpose coming upon your life. Your dream realm was unlocking. You thought you came for stomach issues. And the Spirit of God says, I'm putting you on a fast track. I'm going to unleash provision and acceleration in your life. For today, you can mark my words. You can put it in your journal. For you will see the acceleration of God and provision from this moment forward. And you said, God, I thought you forgot me. And God said, I see you tonight. I saw you then, I see you now, and I'll see you into the future. Fire! In the name of Jesus, and heal our Lord. My sister, can you help me? Can you help me? God's doing something profound in her. In the name of Jesus. 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 The name of Jesus. Some people say you do this at the end. No, you do it when God says do it. That's what's wrong with the church. They've got God in such a box, He ain't even ready to move by the time they want Him to. He's been wanting to move the whole time. Heal in the name of Jesus. For there's no other name under heaven. Jesus' name. More. More, Lord. 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 William Booth said, I'm not waiting 
not a move of God, I am a move of God. I said, William Booth said, I'm not waiting on a move of God, I am a move of God. I am a move of God. You are a move of God. Right up, Bunky said the worst thing that can happen to the church is they pray for revival, raise up another generation that prays for revival, that raises up another generation that prays for revival, that only raises up another generation that prays for revival, and none of them have one. Fire! Heal! God, we ask for testimonies tomorrow of bodies being absolutely healed, digestive systems coming into alignment, ulcers shriveled up and dying in the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. Loose him and let him go. That's God on you. That's God on you. When the last time you've been touched by God? That's his world that's rocking, shaking, till sin can't find it. God, give him a holiness that hurts the eyes. This book right here, you'll want to get your hands on it. Some of you already, I know a lot of your faces, not all of them, but a lot of them. But this book right here, Pioneering Prophetic Patterns of Purpose, it has a whole chapter on the Navajo Nation. 
and the First Nations, how God is going to use the First Nation really as a catalytic weapon for awakening Amen. in the last days. How many believe that? Amen. And so he's going to go to the first first. That's just how God does business. It's, it's the law of first mention. It doesn't mean you're the only one that's going to have a move of God or the First Nations, the only one. But I believe they're the catalytic force in this. It's just kind of the way it is. And so this book, it's, it's powerful to bless you. And then my latest book, Battle Ready Remnant, Called to Contend. There's a lot of liars out there. I mean, there's a lot of liars out there. Oh. A lot of devils, a lot of deception, a lot of Jezebel spirits. Churches collapsing, division happening everywhere. Governments that are liars. I'm not trying to make anybody mad tonight, but this earth is in a mess. Jesus is coming, and we've got to learn how to fight. And so this is Battle Ready Remnant, Called to Contend. It'll teach you how to fight in the spirit realm. And so I want to encourage you with that. There's another book, Uncompromised Revival yeah. Fire. I didn't bring one up here, but Burning Hotter Than Hell. I believe that God's putting a fire in his church that's hotter than what hell's doing. Yeah. And that's available to you tonight. A lot of books on the table. And then we just got this. This is the 100-year kind of compilation of what's happened since the Azusa Street Revival. It's a, it's a tabletop piece. It's a, full of pictures, but it really just reveals the Azusa Street Revival, what happened in 100 years of Pentecost that shook this nation. And so we just got that in. It, 2006 is when it was done. It's an old book, but we got our hands on some, so we wanted to make them available to you. And so there's all kinds of stuff on the table. Time won't allow me to go through all that. But I think I'm going to fight with this pulpit all night long. It's going to want to go up and down and around. And, okay, well, I'll shrink if I have to. But we're, oh, man, I can't get that small. But if someone would like to help me tonight, I don't want to do the limbo where I'm trying to preach the word of God to you. Oh, you twisted. Thank God for Apostle Ron and Carmen. Can we give God praise for him? There's wisdom in a multitude of counselors. I still don't think he's got it, but he says so. Okay, okay, okay. I'm going to put my 10-pound iPad over here and see if this one can do it. I ain't even going to try to put my Bible on there. Just, that might be too much. Man. And also, we got the Fire Bible available back there. It's a spirit-filled study Bible. Many people are totally blessed by it. I want to make an attempt. Let's just see. Let's see. Uh-oh. We don't go, I, got, I got the scripture in my iPad, so we'll just go a different route. How many of you brought your sword tonight? I want to give God praise for really United Tribes, the leadership. I know there's a lot of people working cohesively. And then Pastor Jerry, Tom, Apostle Ron, and Tida Harvey. Everybody that's working together and laboring to host this. Can we put our hands together and give God praise for that? There's always a lot of work involved. There's cooking. There's things that's happening behind the scenes. There's people making sure there's coffee and toilet paper and all kinds of practicalities so that we can have a meeting. And so I never, I'm a pastor, so I don't look past those things like they're no big deal. They're a big deal and a lot of labor happening. I'm on tonight and then tomorrow night, as far as I know, then we'll get in the vehicle after service tomorrow and drive home. But it's been a wild week for me. I mean, we've, we've been all over the place from Galveston, Texas, to Belize, to Honduras, to Cozumel, to Tucson, Arizona, Tulsa, Oklahoma, Amen. Navajo Nation, in the last nine days, I feel like I've got like, I've smelled all kinds of trees and got all kinds of, <laughs> I came here for summer and got winter, and so I needed a cough drop to even do this, so we're going to do our best tonight, but I believe I got a word from God if you want it, how many want it tonight, how many still hungry? I know we've had a lot of gifts that's been expressed. We've made room for a lot of gifts tonight. And so a lot of singing and different things have happened. It's been great. But I'm a preacher of the Word of God. Amen? And so the pure, unadulterated Word of God, I'm almost positive I'll step on toes tonight as part of my calling, is to crunch toes. Okay? And so if you feel like, man, that was just too heavy, that was too in my face, that's just what God built. Amen? If you're looking for a Pee Wee Herman preacher, I'm not the one. And so, Psalm chapter 90, verse number 12. The theme of this entire camp meeting, and, and Philip, thank you for you, new creation. Let me appreciate new creation tonight. But I, I'm, I'm, 
I'm very big on when someone names a camp meeting or a conference, they put a theme on there, that we just don't put false advertisement on there. We don't just put out a poster that says preservation and then inheritance, and then we just talk about a whole bunch of other stuff. Now, if that's already happened up to this point, I wouldn't know because I haven't watched the videos or anything. But I think it's a danger zone when we name something by the Spirit of God and then we just talk about whatever we want. And so I'm here tonight to talk about preservation. Amen? And specifically tonight, you are the salt of the earth, God's weapon of preservation. I want you to hear that. You are the salt of the earth, God's weapon of preservation. Now, let me, let me just say this for just a moment. If you're not salty, you're in sin. I want you to understand this. If you're losing your flavor, Jesus said you might as well be trampled on. And here's the danger in Christianity. You can give your life to Jesus, get saved, get washed in the blood, get baptized in the Holy Ghost, and then you're ready to tell everybody, including your neighbor's dog, about Jesus, and then you go to church over time, and you lose your saltiness. You become a religious professional. You learn how to do church. You clap on demand, sing on demand, raise your hand on demand, say amen, preacher. You do know amen means let it be so. So if you amen me tonight, you're basically coming into agreement with the Word of God saying, I want that in my life. Amen? Amen? So you're basically saying you want to be salty and you don't want to be lukewarm. That's basically what you just agreed to. Everybody okay with that? And so I want to make sure you understand the power of agreement tonight. The power of agreement. And so Psalm 90, it was on the poster here. It says, so teach us to number our days that we may gain a heart of wisdom. How many know you only got a certain amount of days on this earth? You got one life to live for Jesus. The trumpet of God is going to sound. Some people don't even believe that anymore. I'm still a 1 Thessalonians 4 that makes it clear that there's going to be a voice of an archangel, a trumpet of God. The dead in Christ are going to rise, and those who are alive and remain will be caught up in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. Thus you will forever be with the Lord. And when you do that, there will be no do-overs, no makeup tests, no going back to the Navajo Nation saying, I wish I had told someone about Jesus last week. You will have already had accomplished everything that God had assigned for your life. And you can't live in the arena where God's merciful, He's gracious, He knows my heart. He does. But most of the church is lazy. And they have zero souls under their belt. And they prophesy good, but they don't witness well. And they've got dreams and visions, but they do nothing. That's not salty. Amen? Salty people win people to Jesus. And I'm going to say this, and I want you to hear me before we read this next text and we pray. But I believe some of the saltiest people that will walk the face of the earth in the last days will be the First Nations host people of the land. They are going to be the saltiest manifestation of God's power to lead the way. Especially in North America. Especially on the soil of America. And that's why he's turned his face towards the host people of the land. And he's done that and that's already been prophesied. And all over the world, people want to come to the Navajo Nation. They want to go to different tribal communities. They want to be a part of the prophetic leadership of the First Nations. And it's like you're not even trying. And it's just happening everywhere because God's causing you to be real salty. Amen? Amen. Everybody say the First Nations got flavor. Amen. Amen. Don't lose it because you could go to hell over it. Amen? So we're like, you mean God will let me, he, I go to hell if I'm tasteless? Well, read it. You're no good to be trampled on. That's it. Watch what it says, Matthew 5, 13 through 16. You are the salt of the earth, but if the salt loses its flavor, how shall it be seasoned? It's then good for nothing but to be trampled on underfoot by men. Mark 9, 49 says, for everyone will be seasoned with fire. How many want to be seasoned with fire? And every sacrifice will be seasoned with salt. Let's pray. Come on. I want you to just pray in the Holy Ghost. Pray in English, but pray with me. Father, I thank you for the word of God that's quick and active, sharper than any two-edged blade, piercing to the division of soul and spirit and joint and marrow. God, I crack off, break off, shred off, destroy. God, complacency that's in the minds and the hearts of people. God, every bit of apathetic spirit that's tried to come on your church. God, I break the powers of that. God, we declare that lukewarm living makes you sick and makes you want to throw up, according to the word of God. 
And so, God, I ask you to put a fire under this tent. Set us ablaze at this camp meeting. God, I pray that our poster is not false advertisement because that's illegal. God, we said we're having a camp meeting tonight. So, God, may we have a camp in the meeting of the Most High God. May we camp next to your glory. Camp next to your fire. God, camp, camp next to your wind and your oil. God, descend on this tent like a dove and shake us up for your glory and for your name's sake. God, I bind all sickness and disease. God, I overthrow all sin that might be in the camp. God, every bit of drunkenness that might be under this tent. God, those, Lord, that have addictions, God, that want to break them so bad but they can't. God, I ask you to snap the neck of those things. God, those that are carrying demonic spirits that can't sleep at night. At 3 a.m., they're being tormented in their mind. God, I shatter the works of the devil in the name of Jesus, God. And we declare that the salty ones would arise in the last days, God. And we give you the glory for that in Jesus' name. Amen. If you believe it, give Jesus a mighty hand clap. If you believe he's going to get the job done. Worthy are you, Jesus. I felt like the Lord said to me that you're a weapon of preservation. Now, I wanted to find the word preservation or to preserve something for just a moment because I don't know sometimes if we fully understand it. We can think to ourselves, God has preserved the First Nation host people of the Lamb, but he didn't just preserve you to be a people group. The preservation of God is greater than one people group. How I many know when we get to heaven, there's going to be every tongue, tribe, and nation? Which is why we got to be very, 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 listen to me, intentional to make sure that one people group is not the only people group that's going to see the move of God. If we start talking and acting like that and believing like that, you're a liar. Red, yellow, black, white, or green. We were just in the South and we were... In Nashville, and we, I went to KFC. It was the meanest KFC I ever walked into the face of my earth, of the earth. I mean, it, it was it was wild. I didn't know you could be so mean over chicken. I thought we all ate chicken, red, yellow, black, white, or green. I didn't realize my skin color determined what type of customer service I was going to get. But you're in the South, and they cop the nasty attitude, and but when I, I just ended up not spending my money there. I won't tell you the rest of that. I went to another place, and I just walked right in, and I go, are y'all as mean as KFC? And they said, no, we're a little nicer. And I said to them, well, I know I'm in the South, but I'm from the West. Red, yellow, black, white, or green, we serve one another, and we love one another. Come on. And so I want you to understand something. I know First Nation is going to be catalytic for the move of God, but don't get pride and arrogant. Amen? Amen. Some of you may say, well, who are you to talk to me in that tone of voice? I'm on the poster, and they asked me to preach, so that's just kind of <laughs> the way it is. Amen? I didn't ask for this job. I was invited. Amen? Amen. 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 Somebody looking like, does he do title that good? <laughs> We're all over the nation with Apostle Ron and Titan and Pastor Jerry Tom. But preservation means protection. It means to maintenance something. It means to safeguard something. It's the keeping of something. How many believe that? And then I heard this from the Lord. He said, in the last days, son, I want you to warn, especially the First Nation people of the land, that we are going to have to preserve truth because we're being fed a bunch of lies. Straight from the medium, even out of the church right now, we're being fed lies. So we're going to have to preserve the truth. We're going to have to preserve sound doctrine. We're going to have to preserve this call to holiness. For without holiness, no man will see the Lord. So you can't buy the lie of what's legal in America is somehow legal in heaven. It can be legal in America and illegal in heaven. Homosexuality is still illegal in heaven. Drunkenness is still illegal in heaven. No drunkard's going to heaven. No homosexual's going to heaven. No liar is going to heaven. No thief is going to heaven. You've got you to preserve sound doctrine in the last days or you're going to be fooled and duped by the devil. So when I talk about preservation, it isn't just preserve me, protect me, maintenance me, safeguard me. No, raise me up to be a catalytic force that's a safeguard for truth. Come on. That's a safeguard for the word of God in the last days. A safeguard for the doctrine of holiness. A safeguard for the doctrine of the catching away of the church, the return of the Lord Jesus Christ. That many don't believe it anymore because they're scared to death that it's going to happen and they are not ready. Preachers don't preach it because they're not ready for Jesus to crack the clouds yet. They're too busy sleeping around, stealing money, and causing a bunch of division in this nation. 
And so your doctrine will change in accordance to your sin. When I listen to a preacher and they won't preach on sin, it lets me know they're in sin. I want you to remember that for the rest of your life. No matter what church you sit under, if you're not hearing a rebuke against sin, more than likely the pastor's in it. Then I feel the wind blowing. Amen. I hope the tent don't blow down. We're going to preserve a baptism in the Holy Ghost and fire whether visitors like it or not. See, when I think of the First Nation, host people of the land, and your calling and your gifting to be a catalytic torch of awakening in the last days, you're going to have to decide that you don't fear man anymore. Come on. You don't fear what the enemy's doing, what man's doing, what doctrines of devils are trying to creep into the church. You're going to preserve that God is a baptizer. Jesus, John said, one greater than I will come. I'm not worthy to even touch his sandals. He will baptize you in the Holy Ghost and fire. When the wind blew and the fire fell, columns of fire Fell on, fell on their heads and they spoke in an unknown language. I don't care if churches like it. It's Word of God. You might scare off the giver then go give somebody somewhere else. I don't want a building that I've got to maintain by lying to people. Amen. Amen. Most of you are agreeing. Some are agreeing, some are ducking. <laughs> William Booth said this. Many of you have heard this, but I want you to hear it in the context of your call as the First Nations. Because we're going to get into salt in just a moment. I believe the First Nations are going to be some of the saltiest forerunners the earth has ever seen. Amen? Amen? But he said this, William, William Booth, he said, the chief danger that confronts the coming century, listen to this, and you'll say, I've seen this. He prophesied it. That people will believe in religion without the Holy Ghost. They'll want Christianity without Christ. They'll want forgiveness without repentance. Salvation without regeneration. Politics without God. And a heaven without a hell. And we can understand this. He's warning. There are cheap dangers that are going to swallow the church in the last days. He said, here's the danger. Now, I'm going to just put it in context because I don't know if we heard it. We'll want religion, but get that Holy Ghost out of here. We don't want word of knowledge, word of wisdom. We don't want people flopping on the ground like a fish. We don't want the fire of God to hit them till they shake. That's just too much. We don't 